Warning, the following episode discusses the year 2000 horror film Ringu Zero Birthday and contains discussions of violence. A complete list of content warnings can be found in the episode description. Please proceed with caution. This is Take Two. Hello and welcome to Take Two, a semi-weekly show offering critical analysis and contextualization of those films which, for one reason or another, have not made it onto the main feed. This is a space to talk about short films, about shot-on-video films, about direct-to-video and direct-to-DVD films. On today's episode, we'll be talking about the January 2000 film Ringu Zero Birthday, the fifth film in the wildly popular J-horror series Ringu, Now, I have a bit of a confession. Uh, I have actually not watched any of the Ring films. I thought that I had. um, For for a long time, I I thought that I had watched the Ring films. As it turns out, I had actually watched The Grudge, um, and I was just terribly confused. I originally watched um, The Grudge when I was... Oh... Jesus, probably eight years old. And I say I I watched The Grudge. I, I watched part of The Grudge. It honestly, it was just, it was too much for me. Um, I've said again and again on this show um, that I was a very, very timid child. And so a film like The Grudge, it, it was just too intense. It was too much. Um, and it completely fucked me up. I came away from it really, really shaken, you know, the the 10, 15 minutes that I had actually watched the thing. But over the years, I had accumulated knowledge of what Ring was um, as a series, like what the what the premise is. Um, you know, I, I knew about the cursed tape and that you watch it and then you die. I knew about Sadako crawling out of the well or Samara climbing out of the well but I had not actually watched any of the films it wasn't until last year actually um, that I watched the original Japanese ring um, for the first time or Ringu I this this is so confusing because there is there is a 1995 television movie called ring and that is technically the first ring film Ring 1998 is the first theatrical um, adaptation, and it was last year that I finally watched that. I had not seen the Gore Verbinski film. I thought that I had, but again, I it turns out that I had actually watched The Grudge. I have... <laughs> I've seen Rings, uh, the the latest American adaptation. I went and saw that in the cinema uh, with uh, my my best friend Alex uh, Zip, and I I really I actually really enjoyed most of that film. I enjoyed about half of that film. I think that the first half of that movie might be. One of the one of the most exciting um, horror sequels that I that I had seen in in quite some time, but that uh, quickly goes off the rails um, and becomes by the end just absolutely unwatchably bad. We're not here to talk about that film though. We are here today to talk about Ringu Zero, uh, which is as I said the fifth Ring film. In preparation for this episode, I, I, I thought that it was my duty to, to remedy this, to, to sit down and finally watch 
all of the Ring films. Um, so I watched all of the Japanese adaptations, starting with the 1998 film, um, and then watching Spiral, uh, and then Ringu 2, and ending with Ringu Zero. And what a journey it was. Um... <laughs> So when I when I watched Ring uh for the first time last year, I I came away from it very lukewarm. Um I think that I had built it up in my head as being just sort of the the pinnacle of horror. And watching it, I just I I I just didn't vibe with it um at the time. And watching it again this week in in preparation for this show, again I was left really, really lukewarm on it. And I think that I just have come to the conclusion that I really just do not vibe with uh, the director of that film, Hideo Nakata's directorial style. He is a very, very flat um, filmmaker. His, His films, I think, are pushing for a sort of realism that I just personally, it, it just doesn't work for me. I, I find his his cinematography to be really, really lifeless. Um, I don't think that the skiers are executed particularly well. The score is just sort of there. So that was, you know, I, I didn't get off to a great start with um, with Ring. Um, when I when I watched that, it sort of it put me in, you know, a little bit sort of dour spirits because... On this show so far, um, and on and on the main feed, um, I've really only watched one truly terrible film. I I really didn't fuck with Supernova. <laughs> Isola, um, from last week's episode of Take Two, that film has quite a lot of flaws, but ultimately I think was, you know, I, I didn't come away from it feeling, you know, just sort of dejected in the way that I did coming away from uh, coming away from Ring. My opinion of the series, though, shot up pretty much uh, immediately after, though. Um, watching Spiral. Spiral is the second uh, theatrical Ring film, and it is phenomenal. It's it's really really great. It is very playful it's very well shot the the lighting is really on point the story as well is i think a really great example of a sequel that understands the the core of the of the original of the preceding film i had always known uh that ring kind of went off the rails a bit the the novels which these films are based off of they i knew took the took the the broad premise um in some really interesting directions um you know with sadako with the with the cursed tape becoming with the with the curse associated with the tape becoming a physical a physical virus um something that you could track medically um and i always found that really interesting i learned about most of this um just reading wikipedia summaries in the in the past um when i was still too afraid to to watch to watch j horror probably the the biggest impression of um of ring as a series that i had was uh the the video game um, from I think two thousand actually the the Dreamcast game Ring Terror's Realm, which is a very sort of strange Resident Evil style, you know, third person survival horror game um, about a a woman who works for a computer company that has uh, basically contracted the the virus uh the the curse as a computer virus and i found that really like really interesting really bizarre like this this is not what i thought these films were it's not what i thought this story was and so when i then was reading 
the summaries of of the novels, I was a couple of things sort of clicked into place there. Ring is as a series ultimately about the the power of rumors. I don't think that this is an uncontroversial statement. I think that that's probably the most obvious read um, of of the series that you could make. I know that there is a lot of uh, critical thought that has been put into the film's use of technology um, and J-horror's use of technology sort of more broadly. But for me, really, at a nuts and bolts level, stripped of, stripped of all artifice, Ring is a film about the the danger of rumors and the ways that rumors spread through communities and leave tragedy in their wake. And Spiral, I think, really understood this. Um, and I think that it was a really fantastic choice by the original author of, of the Ring novels to literalize that by by making the curse into a true virus, something that can be contracted, that can be passed on from one person to another. Spiral adapts the novel of the same name um, in the Ring series, and as I said, was was really phenomenal. I found it really engaging. I, I enjoyed watching it, and I thought that it was a really unexpected film, um, especially coming off of Ring, which I was so lukewarm on. And then immediately um, I watched Ring 2, expecting more of the same. And instead, I was greeted by a really cookie cutter um, sort of sequel. Ring 2 is, I would say, the, the default sequel. It is what you would, when you think of what you would do in a sequel to Ring, I think that it's pretty much exactly what you would expect. It's basically just Ring happens again. You know, it's 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 changed up in a couple of key ways. Sadako becomes uh, psychically bonded with a child who is able to sort of call on her, summon her at will, um, which is is interesting as a as a concept, but doesn't really go anywhere. And again, I was just, I was so disappointed in the film. And immediately I uh, recognized why Hideo Nakata strikes again and just delivers another really bland, lifeless film. This film, like, it, it looks so much worse than Spiral. Um, I don't know how that's possible. Like, you, I know that there was a pretty quick turnaround on all of these films. Um, they were... They were, I think, all made within basically a year of one another. And I know that that puts a lot of constraints on, you know, what you can achieve. But still, it, it was just kind of shocking to me that we went from this really colorful, you know, spiral and then into just browns and beige, you know, earth tones, people, browns and beige, Ringu Zero. We're we're back on top, baby. I immediately recognized um the director as uh the director of uh Kakashi, uh a a great um film about a young woman who goes uh in search of her brother in a small town that sort of I, I suppose worships scarecrows. That's a really, really great film. And then also POV, a cursed film, a found footage film from 2012, which is also really phenomenal, really, really minimalist for the most part. Um, a lot of a lot of in-camera effects used um, for for the scares, which I always appreciate. Ringu Zero, though, um, was like Spiral, um, a, a film that understood the core of of Ring, of the series, and understood that these were films about the dangers of rumours, again. And this time, as the title implies, uh, we are watching a prequel. Um, it is in, it is talking about Sadako's backstory, um, how she came to be, um, how she came to be trapped in the well, and the, the build-up to that her 
motivations, um, what sort of drives what sort of drives her her anger what what led to the creation of the curse in the first place like how did that all begin and i think the filmmakers make the really smart decision to kind of leave a lot of that up to interpretation this does not show in the way you might expect it does not show how the tape was actually made it doesn't show you what like what physically had to happen for Sadako to imprint herself on this on this tape and for that to be you know who who its first victims were and all of that sort of business instead it leaves all of that sort of in the background um I think the film actually acknowledges it in a really um like kind of fun cheeky like dismissive way (laughs) in the in the beginning of the film's third act um not even the third act the beginning of the climax of the film there's just a moment where um Sadako's father just says yeah at some point she split into two people I I don't know I don't know how that happened (laughs) um and I think that's really I think that does a great job of capturing the the mood of this film this film instead is is more interested in character in Sadako as a person. It is a film that has a lot of empathy for um for this person who up until this point we had only known as um you know a a vengeful spirit as as a force of of nature out to destroy the world. And Ringu Zero makes a point of going, no. Sadako was a person. Um, she was a normal girl, just like you and me, who had problems and who did not receive the proper care that she needed. And that's just, that's so good as a premise. I really, I don't know what to say. It's just, it's so compelling as a, as a backstory for one of the most iconic horror villains of all time and it doesn't do it in a really sort of like perfunctory way um you know it's not trying to do the whole like oh you know Leatherface is is really just misunderstood like it's not it's not doing that it's 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 hard to sort of define the difference between why I think this is you know why this is good and why the you know, why the you should sympathize with, you know, with Jason Voorhees, um, you know, why that doesn't work for me. But I think it just comes down to, I think it really does just come down to execution. This is a very well-made film. I think that it, again, looks really great. Um, I think the cinematography in this one absolutely pops off. Um, I think the color grading is really good. But the thing that really holds it together is um, Yuki Nakama, who portrays Sadako. She is just a phenomenal actress. Um, She is really, really doing a great job of portraying Sadako as someone who is terrified um, of the world, who is sad, who is lonely, who feels apart from the world. And is in some ways right to feel, right to feel afraid. Um, She is, at the start of the film, there are already rumors swirling about her. We know that her mother um, had previously committed suicide. She has moved to Tokyo to get away from rumors that were spreading in her hometown, the majority of which began with the sort of inciting incident of um of her accidental killing of a journalist but continued to um to grow when a group of her classmates all drowned and she was you know there watching on um, she had predicted their deaths and stood by as they as they happened um and so there are there are already rumors swirling about her and by the end of the film, they they will have they will have killed her. Um, these rumors will have just shaken people up 
so much that they are unable to see reason. They are they are unable to be you you can't engage with them anymore on on a human level. You cannot reach out and make a connection. And it it's it's really tragic. Um it's very, very sad. The final moments of this film are some of the bleakest cinema that I have seen in in a long time. Um, Sadako at the bottom of the well, just calling out for Tamiya and I, I hope I'm pronouncing these names correctly, calling out for Tamiya and then calling out for her father is just so, so upsetting. Man, it just, it just hits. I really, I don't know what to say. Um, they just, they knocked it out of the park with this film and it made me... It made me look back on the on the preceding films a lot more fondly. I think that I think that I have I have a respect for the original Ring film for what it was doing. I think that it is just such a slam dunk premise. You can pitch that film to anybody, and I think that they will get it. Um, I think that they will understand what the appeal of it is. Spiral and Ringu Zero are both. I think harder sells um, in some ways, but I think that taken as a whole, these three films do a really, really great job of of telling a complete story, um, of of telling you know a, a thematic arc of how rumors affect um, affect us, affect people. Ring two can fuck off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think I'll leave it there. Um I'd like to thank Yanka Glonis for the use of her track Axe Murderous off of the album Funtime Party Gal. A link to that album and to their bandcamp can be found in the episode description. If you have any comments or queries regarding the show and you want to get in touch, you can do that on Twitter at most maligned or via email mostmaligned at gmail.com. If you could, please take a moment to leave a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice. I would really appreciate it. Good word of mouth is so important in helping to increase this show's listenership, especially in these early days. It will be two weeks until you hear from me again on this feed, but next week on the main show, we'll be discussing February 2000's Bruiser, a forgotten uh, George A. Romero slasher film. Until then, though, this has been Take Two. 